time. I'm privileged to have Dr. Justin Filker visiting us from UT, uh, right up the road. In fact, one of the roads I usually take in, in work, I realize they have the, 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 the railroad bridge no longer supports the train, and so they have extra pylons underneath it, but that means you can't actually drive under that road anymore. I learned that this morning, which, which is fun. I'll explain later, I'm taking your time. So I finished his doctoral work at the University of Arizona, working with Dan Maroney, uh, then ventured forth to UT Austin for a fellowship, which I just asked him, what is the name of it? He said he was told he could call it whatever he likes, so I'll let you decide what that's actually supposed to be called, but he's very much invested in trying to study highly lensed objects and radio sources, and I'll let him take it away from there. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me out here. Technically, I think I'm the Harlan J. Smith Fellow, but I wasn't sure if that was also the McDonald Fellowship. And so they told me to just like. They switched the name every other year. Yeah. Is that, is that a time thing? I don't know that they switched it anymore. They've done the Smith two years in a row now. So who knows? It's one of those things. Uh, close enough. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me out. It's, it's great to be here again. Um, and thank you to Casey for that introduction. So I'm going to talk today mostly about uh, how the way that galaxies form or don't form stars. But before I get going, I have a PSA, which is that uh, I and another postdoc at UT, Jorge as well, are going to be holding an alma proposal workshop uh, at, in Austin sometime in April. And so this is basically designed for if you would like to get into the habit of proposing for alma, but you have no idea how to work with radio stuff at all, um, come and we'll help you. Uh, our idea is basically going to be that there's going to be a lot of time in the afternoon to sort of have like consulting. So if you come with like an idea for like what you think you might want to do, we can help you, you know, decide if that's feasible or you know, what you would need to do to make sure it's feasible uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, and especially if you're a junior person who, who would like to get into working with Alma uh, and if you need help with like travel costs and, and that kind of thing, you can come spend the night at somebody's house or we'll put you up or something like that. So just let's send me an email and that will uh, you know, happen. So we'll probably send an announcement you know, once we figure out what the exact date is, but it will be early April. Uh, anyway, okay, so now for the real real portion of things. Um, so I want to talk to you, talk today about you know, the way that galaxies form or don't form stars. And so if you basically just take a telescope like HST and point it out in the universe, you wind up with a picture that looks like this, the Hubble D field. And within this image, there are thousands of galaxies. Uh, and you can see basically to the ends of the universe all the way down to the local universe uh, in an image like this. And sort of if you take all of these galaxies and try to split them up into the way, you know, split them up into categories the way that we like to do, you find that there's two main types. There are these big, blue, beautiful galaxies. They're forming stars, um, which you can tell because they're blue. But you also have these like big, poofy, red galaxies. And they are uh, basically have not been forming stars for many billions of years. Um, and you can do this sort of division just by eye, which is kind of fun. Uh, this is why probably a lot of us that studied galaxies started studying them because we thought we'd be looking at pictures like this all the time. Uh, instead, my galaxies just look like blobs. But regardless, uh, if you do this a little more quantitatively, you wind up with something like this. This is a, a color magnitude diagram of galaxies. We've known about this for, for decades. But basically, you see that, that fundamental division between blue galaxies and red galaxies with not a whole heck of a lot of galaxies in between them. Um, you also find that the red galaxies tend to be brighter, uh, which also tends to be that they're more massive. But this is not the only way the galaxies sort of split up into two, two different types. Um, they also split up into two different types in terms of stellar mass. So if you, if you just sort galaxies into whether they're star forming or whether they're quiescent, you find that the low mass galaxies are almost all star forming, but the high mass galaxies are almost all quiescent. Um, and they also sort of separate out in terms of, of structure slash physical size. So here the galaxies are color coded red for quiescent and blue for star forming. And you see that they have different relationships between their size and their mass. Um, and those differences actually become more exaggerated as you go to higher richness. So you see that these two lines for the quiescent and star forming galaxies get further apart the further back in time you look. And so this basically tells you that the quiescent galaxies have evolved in size a lot more than the star forming galaxies have over the same amount of time. Um, and so if you, if you want to know what that kind of looks like, uh, here are some pictures of, of redshift two star forming quiescent galaxies where I've tried to, you know, fudge the scale so that they're on the same physical size. Uh, and you see that the, the star forming galaxies, you can still sort of pick out these, these big spiral features that sort of look like star forming galaxies in the local universe. But the quiescent galaxies look like, you know, these little blob things. I 
three of these are different galaxies. They're not all the same one. Um, but they all look like you know, these real small little red dots. Um, and surprisingly, these small little red dots contain 10 to the 11 solar masses of stars. These are like the most massive galaxies that lived at Redshift 2. They're all these tiny little things. Um, and so basically what that means is that uh, galaxies like this are 100 times more dense in terms of like stars per volume uh, than a quiet galaxy, a giant eligible galaxy is today. Um, and so we're trying to basically figure out, well, how does this happen? Um, there's a lot of these things that are sort of interrelated in complicated ways. So how do you turn off the star formation in the galaxy to make a passive galaxy? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, link that with the change in structure that we see? Um, and what are the actual physical processes that lead to this division in galaxies? Um, and so the, the basic catch-all solution is, is what we'll call feedback, which you can't see because it's on the top of the screen. Um, but I assure you it says feedback. And the reason that people like feedback is because it solves so many problems in galaxies. It also creates more, more problems, but it, it solves a whole bunch of them. So for example, it, it basically is a way that you can uh, fix the relationship between the stellar mass function and the halo mass function. So basically, if you take a dark matter only simulation and plot the number of halos per unit mass, or the number of halos at a given mass, you find that the stellar mass function doesn't match that at all. And it particularly doesn't match the very high mass end, where we think that AGN feedback is probably important, or at the low mass end, where we think that feedback from supernovae is probably really important. Uh, but it also solves a whole bunch of other problems. So for example, it links the, the properties of supermassive black holes in galaxies to the, the overall host galaxies. Uh, it links the, the normalization of the way that stars and gas, the molecular gas and the star formation rate of galaxies uh, connect together. Uh, it is a really good way for you to get baryons and metals out into the halos around galaxies instead of having them all be, be centered down in galaxy disks. And of course, it also is a, is a good way to shut down star formation and, and keep it that way. Um, and so given that this, this feedback paradigm sort of solves all of these many, many problems, it's also very complex, because you can't usually solve many problems with one simple solution. Um, and you can sort of broadly uh, categorize the process of feedback into two main types. Again, so we have external processes and we have internal processes. So the external processes are all things that have to do with where a galaxy lives. So does it live in a cluster? Does it live in a void? Does it live you know, with a nearby neighbor that it's interacting with? Where the internal processes are, are basically all of these things that a galaxy can do to itself. So these are things like star, uh, star formation, uh, you know, supernovae or, or stellar winds, or uh, heating from, from massive stars, AGN, or this thing called morphological quenching, which I'll get to in just a second. So external processes are, are usually most relevant at, at, at low redshift, at lower redshift. Uh, and that's just basically because it takes a while to, to develop these overdense structures where you can really sort of enhance those environmental effects. So this is things like strangulation and harassment and all this sort of stuff. And we see good evidence of this on both in individual cases. This is a case of a galaxy falling that way in towards a cluster, and you can see that it's got a lot of gas being trailed out of it uh, as, it's, as it's flying through the, the cluster gas. And it's also been uh, pretty well established in sort of a statistical sense. So what we see here is that uh, these central galaxies tend to, be, tend to be more quiescent than the satellite galaxies in, in these overdense regions. And both of them are, are tend to be more quiescent than galaxies that are not in overdense regions. So both in sort of an individual sense and in a population statistical sense, uh, these external processes, we know a, a fair amount about them. And so I'm basically not going to talk about them after this. Uh, so as, as far as internal processes go, I mentioned that morphological quenching. And so the basic idea here is that if you have, uh, you can rearrange the mass within a galaxy in such a way that it makes it hard for stars to form. And so if you make, for example, a stellar bulge that's really massive that has like, you know, 90% of the, the baryonic mass in a given region, it's hard to get a gas disk in there to form stars because you actually alter the stability of the gas and that makes it hard for, for stars to form. Um, and so one example of this from a simulation is, is this galaxy here. You can see that over time, uh, the, the star formation rate of this galaxy basically plateaus to zero, even though it's accreting more gas. So basically because it has a large bulge already, even though you're dumping more gas into the galaxy, it's not able to turn that gas into stars. And basically the only thing that breaks it out of that at late times is because this particular one went, uh, went through a major merger, uh, at like you know, 11 million years or something like that. And so this can be a good way to basically stash some gas into a galaxy without 
having it be able to do anything. Um, it's also possible that's a numerical artifact, but oh, yeah, sure. But I don't specifically use it. Cold gas. Yeah. About, right? Yeah. So this can be cold gas, and it doesn't necessarily have to turn into stars. Um, the other. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So the other the other big uh, internal process that I'm going to talk about a lot are, are galactic winds. And so this is basically, you know, if if you think that you're going to turn gas into into stars, well, if you just take that gas and move it out of the galaxy, your problem is solved. Um, and so we we see this, you know, winds basically ubiquitously throughout the local universe. So this is M82, the famous starburst galaxy, it has a central starburst here, and you end up seeing. Uh, uh, huge molecular and ionized and dust and really hot gas, all in this bipolar outflow. And so basically this galaxy has some prospect of, of being able to suppress its star formation because it just gets rid of all its fuel for star formation. Uh, here's another example. This is the radio galaxy series A. And so in this case, you see these huge radio jets coming out of the AGN. So this basically tells you that the AGN is dumping a whole crap ton of energy into this galaxy. And you can use that to heat the gas and prevent it from from forming stars. Um, so like I said, M82 has been observed in, in all of these different ways, uh, and a wind is detected in basically all of them. And so even for that very nearby galaxy, we end up with a cartoon that looks sort of like this thing on the left. You are not meant to read all the text on here, uh, but the fact that there's a lot of text tells you that it's complicated. Um, and so basically what, what this means is that, you know, uh, these winds are detectable in, in all of these various different ways, and you, each time you observe a, a wind, you're basically picking out some tiny little piece of it. And so this is another way of looking at that from a simulation. This is the density of gas on the x-axis, and then the speed of gas, or the temperature uh, of the gas that's in a, in a wind. And so what you see essentially is that the, the gas expands like five or six orders of magnitude in temperature and density, and like you know a thousand kilometers per second in, in velocity. And so if you, for example, look in, in the x-rays, you're really sensitive to very hot, very tenuous gas. And so you would pick out only the material that's way up here. Whereas if you picked out like you know warm, ionized gas with like H alpha, for example, you pick out gas that's around 10 to the 4 Kelvin, sort of in this regime. And so one of the big problems that we have when we're trying to understand the effects of winds and how that relates to how galaxies form or don't form stars is that a lot of the times we're only looking at like small little chunks of this of this space, um, and only for like galaxies like M82 can we can we really add them all together to get sort of a coherent picture of things. So I'm going to talk about that more way at the very end of things. Okay, so the basic plan for today is uh, to go through a few different populations of galaxies. Uh, since feedback and, and galaxy quenching is so complicated, sometimes we can get at it through indirect means, and sometimes we can get it through more direct means. So we're going to start off with a couple ways that we're getting at this problem sort of indirectly, and then at the end we'll get to you know the more fun way, which is directly. So I'm basically going to talk about three different populations of galaxies that we think are are good uh, to study if we want to understand how galaxies quench. So the first one are these galaxies that range from 0.7 that are that are quiescent. We know that they've been quiescent for a couple billion years, uh, at least. And then we'll move to slightly higher redshift, where we're seeing galaxies that we think are in actively in the process of, of quenching their star formation. And then we'll go to, to the very highest redshift and, and look at some of the galaxies that we think are you know, actually having these, these massive winds. Uh, so this is not really to imply that you know one galaxy turns into the other, turns into the other, necessarily. But um, although I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Uh, but it is sort of just a way that we can get you know as many hands onto this complex problem as we possibly can. Um, okay, so for this this first section, we're going to talk about these these galaxies that are uh, you know already quiescent. They're at Richard point seven, um, and so in order to, for this to make sense, uh, I have to talk a little bit about the way that uh, molecular gas scales within galaxies. So that's also text that's cut out on top. That's okay. Um, and so basically, uh, the, the name of the game here is that over the past 15 years, we've spent thousands of hours, like literally thousands of hours on radio telescopes, trying to understand how molecular gas varies with other galaxy properties, like the star formation rate, or the stellar mass, or the galaxy size, or the environment. Um, and unfortunately, this is as pretty of a plot as that has been condensed down to. So I'm sorry that this is thousands of hours, and it's like not super great. But basically what it shows is, is that, you know, we're trying to split up the main things that, that determine how much molecular gas a galaxy has. 
So one of the ones that matters a lot is, is redshift. So galaxies at higher redshift tend to have a lot more gas than galaxies at lower redshift, because uh, the universe in, as, a, as a whole was more gas rich in the past. Uh, star formation rate also matters a lot. Galaxies that have high star formation rates also have a lot of, a lot of gas. That also makes sense. Um, and one thing that matters sort of only a little bit is, is stellar mass, where galaxies that are more massive have slightly less gas than galaxies that are less massive. Um, yeah, so that's you know thousands of, of hours of, of data. So that's as pretty as it gets, I'm sorry. Um, but if we sort of turn that into a table, it looks something like this. So the two quantities that we're mostly interested in are, are the gas fraction, which is basically the you know, gas mass divided by the stellar mass, or this depletion time, which is the gas mass divided by the star formation rate. And that basically tells you, like, you know, how long can a galaxy keep forming stars until it runs out of gas. Um, in practice, the star formation rate probably changes, but we ignore that for the purposes of this. And so we see that with, with redshift, the gas fraction increases really quickly, but the depletion time doesn't change all that much. The star formation rate, uh, you know, yeah, uh, the gas fraction increases a lot, and the depletion time decreases a lot. So galaxies that uh, are really highly star forming have a low number for, for this depletion time. I'm sure you're shocked to, to hear that. Uh, if you divide by a large number, you get a low number. Um, and the stellar mass uh, has sort of a moderate effect uh, on both those quantities. Um, and so this is, like I said, been like 15 or 20 years of, of observational effort. Um, and this has all been done for star-forming galaxies. Um, for passive galaxies, the, the situation has been really different. And uh, mostly that's because if you have a galaxy with a low star formation rate, well, that tells us that the gas fraction should be very small. Uh, and that's hard to observe. And so basically nobody has, has really tried to understand the, the gas contents of passive galaxies. Um, and so that was one thing that we wanted to do with, with ALMA. Uh, so I, I did this program to basically look at this sample of Richard point seven galaxies, which is the first time anybody's looked at a passive galaxy outside of Richard zero, which I was a little surprised by. Um, but basically we wind up here. These are all local giant elliptical galaxies. So basically there's been nothing outside the local universe. Um, and the idea was that we were going to just select them to be you know, relatively passive compared to all of the galaxies at that, at that redshift. The really cool thing about this sample is it comes from the legacy survey which was a giant VLT VMOS program. But basically, it uh, got 20 hour iterations on, you know, like 3,000 massive galaxies at Richard 0.7. And so you have these like really gorgeous optical spectra. I don't do optical spectra, but I'm told that these are really gorgeous. Like, you can make out all these stellar absorption features. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, you can see like emission lines coming up from within the absorption features. Like, you can resolve that. Um, and so there's just like this huge, rich spectroscopic uh, and you know ancillary information that we have for, for the sample, which is kind of why we picked it. Um, and so we, we went for it with Alma, and we got eight galaxies because that's where you start. Uh, and we detected half of them. So we were observing uh, the CO molecule, which is a good tracer of molecular gas, and we detected half of them. So I was, you know a little scared because the first four that came in were all non-detections, but then the second four were all detected, so I was pretty happy. Um, and so we're looking at very massive galaxies, and they're also old. So these are not things where the spectrum tell us that they've recently stopped forming stars. They're not things that where we can see that they're you know, actively forming much of the way of stars. Uh, these things are, are quiescent, and they have been for quite some time. Justin, would you? Yes. You're out of your deal talk. <coughs> would you claim rotation in any of those? Actually, yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's hard to say because the signal is not super great. Um, but in, in you know, basically all of the ones that we detect, we can see that there's an offset between red and blue. Um, and, and from the optical spectra, actually, you can also get a, a, a sense of the rotation because you can see the, the rotation in the stellar absorption features. Is it in the same direction? Yeah. Yep. So that's an interesting point. Um, you bring up so so basically the, the reason that's interesting is that if you look at what gold giant elliptical galaxies, like roughly a third to a half the time, the gas and the star, the stellar rotation are misaligned, and that basically tells you that the gas was like accreted later. So you had your stars that were already rotating in one direction, and then you got your stars a little later, your gas a little later, and that can rotate in whatever direction it wants. Uh, but these don't look like they're that way. So this looks like this is probably gas that was still within those galaxies when they became quiescent, and it's just sort of sat there. Um, okay, so where do these, these galaxies live on these sort of scaling relations? So 
this is a little bit complicated, so I want to you know, walk through a little bit. But these lines are basically uh, the, the way that we think that the gas fraction and the depletion time vary uh, compared to where, how highly star forming a galaxy is. So as we go down, we're talking about more and more passive galaxies. Uh, so these, these lines and, and shaded regions are, are previously determined you know, scaling relations, where the dark shading is basically like, what is the most quiescent galaxy in that sample? And then below that, I'm just sort of extrapolating, and that's where we get this light shading. Um, okay, so if we throw up our, our star-forming galaxies, you know, they cluster around the, the scaling relations, which is good, because those, that's where they came from. Um, but if we throw our passive galaxies on here, they actually tend not to fall on those scaling relations at all. Um, and so basically, in both the depletion time and the gas fraction, we find that they're less, they have even less gas than you would have expected. So, uh, you know, and, you know, I sacked all our non-detection. So that gets pretty far out there. You look like you're about to say. I was going to ask you where those specific star formation rates come from. Would those be called in proportion? So it's UV plus IR. Okay. So, uh, right, so that's the question, right? It's like, is the star formation rate actually lower? And the answer is that the star formation rate doesn't have to be lower by like an order of magnitude to bring these into consistency. Um, and if you believe, you know, the, the people who have like tried to analyze how good is the UV plus IR, we, we should be within a factor of two. At, at, with these data, um, so you should need a lot more than than what is likely. Okay. Let's not go there because I would yeah. argue that you know, when you start applying these star formation rate relations for star forming galaxies to massive galaxies, yep. a lot of the yeah. falls off. There is a, there is a lot of, but even so, even in the UV alone, yeah. So the, the big the big thing comes from the IR, uh, yeah. where you get dust heated by like AGB stars and other things that aren't actively star forming. But even if you look at just the UV star formation. So I'm hoping that we're okay. Um, but in general, you know, I think it's still the case, right, that uh, we're finding these galaxies are even more gas poor than, than we thought that they were going to be. So when I designed this program, I expected us to detect all of them at high significance, and instead of only to take half. So even from the beginning, I knew that these were going to be very gas poor. Um, and so the next question you might ask is, well, how do these things relate to, to present-day passive galaxies? Well, uh, so here's a, a plot that basically shows the evolution with redshift of the gas fraction. So these are all star-forming galaxies on here. So we find that, you know, this is the thousands of hours of, of data that's taken. So we find that as, as we go lower and lower in redshift, galaxies get sort of a little bit uh, less gas-rich, but not, not super uh, significantly. If I throw all those giant elliptical galaxies on here, they sit over there, you know, very, very gas-poor. Excuse me. Whereas our galaxies sit here, and so uh, if I just take those depletion times that I measured before and say, well, what happens to these galaxies if they just continue to evolve in that exact same way, uh, they actually wind up hitting bang on with, with the local quiescent population. This is cool because uh, it's a very natural connection. You don't need uh, anything weird to happen to these galaxies over time. You literally can just let them sit there and passively evolve, and they very naturally reproduce the, the local population. Um, so I think that's really neat because uh, you know one one of the, the, the things that this means is that uh, these galaxies don't need to accrete any more gas. Like you don't have to have a lot of, of gas accretion for them to, to line up anywhere that you want them to. Um, and also it means that you know our depletion times were pretty short actually. And so this idea of morphological quenching where you have a lot of gas but it's not forming stars. That's basically not what we're seeing at all in, in this case. We're seeing that the galaxies will just evolve in exactly the same way that they have been. So we don't need we don't need that more one. Okay, so this is kind of a good place to stop. If there's more questions. Okay, cool. Uh, so the next the next sort of chunk of this is is to look at this population of galaxies at slightly higher redshift, uh, and this time we're going to look at some galaxies that we think are actively quenching. Um, and so this was a program I started because I really wanted to use the VLA because I didn't feel like I was going to be a real radio astronomer until I had used the VLA. Um, and as evidence of that, I have some like old embarrassing pictures of myself uh, and, and the lovely Jody Foster from Contact, which is of course every radio astronomer's favorite movie of all time. Um, yeah. so, and, and, and what are you listening to? What am I looking? No, you're, you're just like listening for aliens, you know. No. 
So you're not actually tied into the fee from people. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cord is just like dangling on the ground. <laughs> Let him live his fantasy. That's right. You know, I, I like static. I want to listen to some static. Crush your dreams. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Okay, so, so like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we've known for a long time that, that galaxies structurally evolve uh, you know, with redshift. And especially as you go to higher and higher redshift, you find that the star forming and quiescent and populations really diverge. Um, and so one of the questions is, you know, basically, how does that happen? Well, you'll notice that there are, well, I mean, I can notice because I'm right next to the screen, uh, but there are some blue dots that live down here in the same region as the quiescent. And so there's this thought that's like, well, what if we, look at those galaxies in particular, they look structurally exactly the same as quiescent galaxies at that redshift. So basically all you would need to do in order to make a quiescent galaxy at that time is, is get the stars to stop forming, and then you, you basically have your quiescent population. So the idea is like, you know, maybe we've already had this, this structural change, and then we just sort of let the star formation fade off into the distance, and you, you wind up with your quiescent galaxies. And so this has been done by, by a number of people uh, where you're basically trying to pick out only the galaxies that live uh, uh, in that quiescent region of, of size and mass, but you pick ones that are still forming stars. So they're still forming stars exactly like normal galaxies, uh, they just structurally look different. And so just to show what those look like, uh, again, now you can sort of tell that these are different galaxies because they look a little bit different in color, but they all still look sort of the same, uh, and that's because they were selected to, to look that way. So these very, very compact, massive galaxies. And so in comparison to a, a star-forming galaxy of the same redshift, uh, which is big and poofy and spirally, uh, these galaxies are small and red and, and clumpy. So people call these red nuggets, which is a phrase that I don't really care for. It evokes images, which we don't want. Um, and so one, one of the things that's sort of interesting about this population is that they might be signposts of the way that you form stellar bulges. So like in the local universe, we have all of these galaxies that have these big bulges of stars in the centers, the Milky Way does, um, and, and this is a good way to do it. And so this was a, a paper from Guillermo Barro about a couple of years ago, um, where he got some really high resolution all the data looking at one of these compact galaxies. Um, and so what he saw basically was that the, we have the stellar light coming from here, a couple few kiloparsecs in size, and then the dust emission, which is tracing the obscured star formation, is even way smaller, way more compact uh, than the stars. And so what that tells you is that all of these stars are forming within you know, some really small region at the center of the galaxy. Uh, and so that's sort of illustrated, illustrated here. And so basically, if you're forming all of these stars at the center of a galaxy, well, that's exactly where stellar bulges live. And so you can basically form uh, a, a Milky Way bulge mass of stars in about 10 to 100 billion years. And so that was, that was kind of cool. Um, but the problem with this was that these, these galaxies that, that he observed were, were sort of biased towards the highest star formation rates because he wanted them to be easily detectable with ALMA because he was doing really high resolution, which takes a long time. Um, so it was not maybe necessarily the most representative survey of things. And so what I wanted to do uh, with the BLA was basically see if we could uh, look at galaxies that weren't maybe quite so extreme. Uh, and this is again using uh, the BLA looking at CO. And so we had a sample of three objects and we ended up detecting one, which was good. Again, these were the first two and they were both non-detections and I was really bummed. And then the third one came in and we detected it and I you know, breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, so that was always really nice. And so the question is, you know, uh, where does this galaxy, where do these galaxies sit in comparison to these other normal galaxies? The answer is that these are actually like the most gas-poor galaxies that have ever been observed in region two. So if you look at like a normal galaxy, like half of the mass is in, is in molecular gas. With these things, it's like 10% or less. This is like a factor of three or five less gas than, than you would otherwise expect. Similar story in terms of the depletion time, a normal galaxy has a would use up its gas in about a billion years. These are like 100 million years or less. And so we think that we're seeing these galaxies at like, you know, right at this brink of where they're going to become quiescent. So by, just by selecting galaxies that have this sort of weird structure, we think that we've already sort of found a, a population that's, you know, on the verge of, of quenching. Um, and so one of the cool things that we can do now that we've detected Sorry, just, I'm just yes. were selected to be quiescent or were they just selected They were selected to, to be star forming. Okay, so they, yes, they were selected to be star forming, massive, and, and compact. Yeah. Yeah. So 
so there are galaxies of this redshift that are, you can select them to be quiescent, and that's the bulk of the population. Uh, so these points are not on here because you can't publish it here. Uh, but they all they all they were higher. Yeah, they live in the same same region. So they have higher gas fraction. Am I misremembering? No, they, well, so they were like maybe a little bit higher. Okay, but it depends on how you convert. Yeah. Anyway, I have thoughts on that. So, um, yeah. So now now we have this sort of unique population that we can use, I hope, as sort of a lab for understanding how galaxies quench, because we think that we have this population. It's basically right now going to stop forming stars. Um, and the thing that I, I kind of want to test now is this idea called inside-out quenching, which is what would be up on the top of the projector. But the basic idea is that you, you end up suppressing the star formation in the center regions of the galaxy first, and then the star formation continues in the outskirts for a little while longer until eventually uh, the galaxy is totally quiescent. And so this is a, a picture from a simulation um, where the, the stars are on the bottom row and the gas is on the top row. And so what you see is that as you as you progress through this star forming phase to the point where you become quiescent, the stars are always sort of concentrated in the center. So you form a stellar bulge and you have this extended sort of stellar stellar light. But what you end up finding actually if you if you look at the gas is that you deplete the gas in the center regions really quickly and you wind up ending, ending up, excuse me, end up having gas only living in like these weird ring-like structures uh, in the outskirts of galaxies. And so when I saw this, I thought like for sure this is garbage because I have never seen a galaxy that looks like this before. Apparently Janelle is finding galaxies that also look like that. Well, and so I, scales, though, but yeah, I, right. Um, yeah, so this is where you have like a few kiloparsecs where, the, where these rings are. So I thought for sure this was garbage and I thought we were going to be able to go back to the VLA and show that this was garbage. Um, and so what we ended up doing was, was following up that one detected galaxy at, at higher resolution. Looks like this. And lo and behold, I was wrong, uh, and actually the gas fraction is depleted in the center. Um, and so this is kind of like a, a unique way of finding that, you know, maybe this inside out quenching thing is <coughs> total garbage. Uh, I assumed it was just going to be some problem with like their implementation of feedback. There's a lot of knobs and simulations. Maybe one of them got turned to somewhere that, that wasn't real. But lo and behold, there is a, a hole in the, the, the gas fraction uh, with radius, which I was not expecting. So this is sort of another uh, like independent line of evidence that, that is that <coughs> can happen, um, and it's happening in effect uh, at redshift two in these galaxies that are rapidly transitioning. Okay, so sort of the last thing that I want to talk about now is is going to even higher redshift, and now we're finally going to get to like the most direct handle of, of, of feedback that we have. So these previous you know sections that I've talked about were you know, maybe a little disappointing because we're not actually seeing feedback in action. We will. Um, and so the, the population of galaxies that we're going to look at for this are these uh, high redshift, really dusty starburst galaxies. And the reason that we're going to look at these is that there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that these galaxies are going to become quiescent soon. Um, so they, A, are just very massive, and massive galaxies tend to become quiescent really quickly. Um, they live in very massive halos. This is a complicated way of showing that. They end up living in halos that are, you know, 10 to the 12 and a half, 10 to the 13 solar masses. Galaxies that live in massive halos also tend to become quiescent very early. And they also look structurally similar to quiescent galaxies. So this is mass and size again. We find that the, these dusty galaxies live in the, the compact region where those quiescent galaxies also lived. And so there's like, you know, all this circumstantial evidence. We also know that there are uh, quiescent galaxies that already exist at Richard 4, uh, which Kind of surprising to me even still, just because there's so much gas at Richard 4 that it's hard to believe anything can be quiescent. But lo and behold, there they are. Um, and if you if you ask, you know, what kind of, of galaxy could have made a passive galaxy at Richard 4, uh, you find that the star formation rate that you would need is, is orders of magnitude higher than a typical UV bright galaxy that lived at that time. On the other hand, if you have these dusty galaxies with a star formation rate of hundreds or a thousand, you can still easily make a massive galaxy that's, that's this massive by region 4 and turn it quiescent. And so there's, you know, like I say, all these sort of like hand wavy arguments that, that these dusty galaxies are, are going to become quiescent quickly. Uh, and nowadays we're, we're really fortunate because we actually have uh, samples of hundreds or thousands of galaxies. So 
most of this text is illegible. Um, but this is a 100 square degree uh, Herschel field. So the Herschel Space Observatory observed uh, you know, in far, far infrared wavelengths uh, and discovered, discovered many, many hundreds of, of uh, obscure dusty galaxies. Uh, the sample that I work with comes from another telescope, the South Pole Telescope, which looked at even longer wavelengths and did 2,500 square degrees. Um, and so basically, you know, we now have these really big samples of these dusty galaxies. The problem is that we don't get riches for free, uh, unlike the Lyman Brake community, which is a little bit of a pain. And so that still ends up being a bottleneck for, for a lot of this sort of analysis. Um, so like I say, I worked on the, the SPT survey for most of my thesis, and I'm still working with, with some things from that now. But the basic way that this works uh, was it served 2,500 square degrees of the southern sky, generally looking for anisotropies in the CMB. So as it turns out, fortunately for me, there are galaxies between the CMB and us, uh, which is nice. And you can actually detect them. And so the way that this sample was constructed was basically to pick out only the brightest things, which is easy for, for follow-up observations. But it also went, winds up sort of uh, circumstantially uh, leading you to a sample of almost purely gravitationally lensed galaxies. So the reason for this is that basically there should be no galaxy in the universe that is this bright unless it's being amplified by gravitational lensing. So just as a reminder, that's where you have a, a galaxy whose light is being magnified by a foreground galaxy. Um, and so the cool thing about this is that uh, the, the foreground lenses all tend to be like giant elliptical galaxies, and so you see those things in like optical images and near IR images, whereas the background things are very, very dusty, and so you see those in, in images from like Alma, for example. And so there, there's this nice, really clean separation because you don't see the foreground galaxy in Alma, and you don't see the background galaxy in like an HST image unless you try really hard. Um, and so it just makes for this really clean, clean thing. Um, and so the, the two main advantages of, of having a lens sample like this are A, we can get higher spatial resolutions essentially for free, and B, we can detect fainter spectral features also more or less for free. Um, and so a big part of my thesis uh, was writing this, this lensing code that works specifically for interferometric disabilities. Um, and so we had a sample of about 50, 50 objects very early on in, in all the operations. It was like two minutes of data per source. Uh, and we wound up with, with really spectacular looking images. And so this code uh, that I wrote uh, can do fancy things like this galaxy is lensed by three different lens galaxies, um, and you can just automatically get up, get up the source structure. And so the, the idea behind this was that you know, now we have the intrinsic structure of the sources. We also got the richest from Alma, uh, which I also worked on, and we don't really have time to talk about now. Um, as a side note, I recently modified this code to work also for unlensed sources. So it's kind of like for those in the, like a gal fit, but that works with, with a barometer data. So this ends up doing a better job than like if you were to try to use gal fit on an image because you take full advantage of the information that's in the visibilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have any need of that, send me an email. I'm happy to help it. Help you out. Um, okay, so the, the thing that I'm, I'm now using this sample for is, is to try to you know, like I said, directly get it at feedback. And so the way that we're going to do this is, is to try to trace actual molecular winds at high redshift. And so we're going to use this molecule called OH, which ends up being a really, really good tracer of galactic winds for, for various reasons. So it's really easy to form, has really strong transitions, it absorbs where the galaxy is at the bright, very brightest that it can possibly be, and we have a really nice comparison sample at low redshift from Herschel. And so the way that you see winds is in absorption, and so OH is a doublet molecule, and so it has two absorption lines, but we can look for, for blue shifted absorption. And if it's blue shifted and it's absorption, that means it's moving towards you, right? And it's in front of the galaxy compared to, uh, you know, the galaxy itself. So it's definitely, you know, moving towards you and it's a wind. Um, and so I've been trying for, for several years now to build up this, this sample of, of galaxies with winds. Um, we're now targeting, like, like Seven might be out of date. I think it's seven we might have now. Uh, and I think the final sample will be somewhere around 12. But these galaxies are rigid four to about five and a half, uh, where we look to see if we can detect actual molecular winds. Um, and so just to sort of illustrate this, here's, here's the first one that finally got published last year. This is a galaxy at of 5.3. The star formation rate is about 800 solar masses per year. So this is, you know, cranking right along. Um, 
And just sort of to illustrate, I'm just going to try to walk us through you know, what a wave looks like. So just for comparison, here's a, a spectrum of the C plus line in this galaxy. And that's just sort of, sort of give you an indication of like what velocities correspond to stuff inside the galaxy. Um, and so if we were to see uh, OH absorption only from gas that's inside the galaxy, we would see those two doublet absorption features right at those same velocities, um, corresponding to quantum mechanics. Um, on the other hand, if it, if it were a wind, we would see those absorption features blue shifted, right? Uh, so the actual data look like this. <laughs> so it's a little more complicated. But what you can still see, right, is that we see both some, some systemic absorption at those same velocities and also this really blue shifted wing. Um, and so I can still sort of uh, divide those into those same velocities where we have some portion of absorption that's from the systemic velocities that's still gas that's inside the, gal that's inside the galaxies, but also this blue shifted wind, right? And then the total combination of those fits the data really well. Um, so, uh, like I say, the other, uh, one of the other nice things about these, these data is that we actually spatially resolve the galaxies. So we can actually get some handle on what the spatial structure of, of these absorption features are. And one of the nice things about ALMA is that it has really high spectral resolution. And so I can split up uh, the absorption into the, these components. So for example, if I look at only at the velocities that are right here, I just have basically only to the gas that's inside the galaxy. I'm only looking at the systemic set. And if I pick up the, the data from only those velocities that are more blue shifted, I see only the, width, the absorption from the wind. So I can kind of split up this galaxy into you know, the continuum, the systemic absorption, and the wind. And they're really divided really nicely. Um, so here's what the lens model of the continuum looks like. Uh, this is a proxy basically for the star formation rate, uh, because this is really close to the peak of the dust emission. So we don't really see any clumps or any sort of obvious features there. Uh, it looks basically just like a big old blob of, of star formation. On the other hand, uh, the systemic absorption, uh, if I pick out only those, only those velocities, is sort of centrally peaked towards the middle regions. That makes sense because towards the, the center regions of the galaxy, that's where the column densities are the highest, so you can get absorption really easy there. That all makes sense, that's all fine. Uh, but the wind, I think, is really cool. Uh, it's hard to tell on this projector. But it basically splits up into like a few different absorbing clumps. And so basically what we're seeing is like that this wind is not some spherical, homogeneous, expanding thing. It's actually split up into these, these clumps that are about a few hundred parsecs in size. Uh, for reference, I didn't put the version in here where we have the resolution. But for reference, the resolution element is about this big. It's about that big. There are more than two clumps? I just look at that and see you as a north. Yeah, so there's for sure two clumps, and maybe there's some other absorption. Uh, the nice thing is that like all the, the math adds up. So like if I go back to the spectrum and like sum this and I sum that and I sum that, we get all the same same numbers. So I was quite pleased with how this ended up working out. Um, and so you know, of course, the, the number that everyone wants to know is well, how much mass is, is in this outflow? How fast is it is it being removed? The answer is really really quickly actually. So uh, our best guess for the, the outflow rate is something like. 800 solar masses per year as well. So basically, just as fast as this galaxy can turn gas into stars, it's removing that gas and then sending it somewhere else. Um, and that's actually really commonly observed. So all these other points are, are low redshift, like which is zero work. And what you see is that uh, the outflow rate in molecular gas alone is almost always like the same as the star formation rate. Um, and that's not even including you know any of these other outflow phases, any warmer gas. Uh, so we published this in Science last year, which was a really long process, uh, but it was all worth it for this. Uh, so it was published in the Daily Mail, uh, which everybody is a fan of. And the best part of seeing the work published somewhere is like the online comments, of course. So we got, of course, OG MVP saying, all very interesting, but who cares, really? So honestly, that just makes me feel so good about myself. And A.K. Ferguson, who tells us, there's no such number as 12 billion light years. Utter rubbish. So really, if somebody has never called your work utter rubbish before, you know, like, I recommend it. It's hilarious. Um, OK, so, so the cool thing about this, this project uh, and, that, and that observation was that it was really fast. So that took us all of half an hour with ALMA. And so this is something that's not like, it's not like you can only do this for one galaxy because it took two days or something like that. We can do this for many objects. Um, and so that's what I've been working towards. Um, so here's you know four of the ones that we have so far, and so far we've detected an outflow in every single one of them. 
So every single one, you see this blue shifted tail of absorption. And so since we're seeing it as absorption, that automatically tells you something about, you know, A, there has to almost always be a wind in these galaxies. A currents rate will has to be close to 100%. But we always see it. And B, since it's an absorption, that sort of constrains the geometry, right? Because you have to have a wind material between you and the galaxy. And so either there's like, you know, this nuclear spherical outflow or this larger outflow, but either way, you almost always see something in absorption. And so, uh, you know, this is you know, getting to resolutions of like a few hundred kilopar or a few hundred parsecs, excuse me. Um, but we're nowhere near the close to the highest resolution that all of them possibly do. So one thing I'm super stoked about uh, is to go back and observe the same galaxy at much higher resolution. So for comparison, here is our old resolution, and here's what we're going to have. Um, and so this will basically allow us to reconstruct the structure of a molecular wind at Richard 5 down to scales of 1 or 200 parsecs, which I think is really, really neat. Uh, like, this is comparable to what you can do in, in the local universe in, in many ways. Uh, and the idea is basically that we want to match the resolution of, of the nearest spec IFU uh, on GWC for reasons which will become clear momentarily. Uh, as, as I'm sure you can guess. Um, so I, I showed this before, um, right? And so this, this plot of showing the, the many different phases of molecular winds. And so right now, what we're essentially looking at is this material that's down here, this really dense, cold stuff. And so we're basically seeing none of this much warmer material. And so it's, it's, I always like to think of it as like that classic, you know, five scientists who grab onto a piece of an elephant, and they all describe what each other sees. And one has the tail and says it's hairy, and one has the side and it's smooth. Well, so right now we have like you know the tail of, of this elephant, and it would be really nice to get a little bit more uh, elephant, so we can tell that it's actually an elephant and not like I don't know a tiger or something like that. Um, and so the way that we're going to do that actually is, is with JWST, and so I'm uh, involved with this early early science program called Templates. Um, it's been approved for about 50 hours of observations, and the basic idea is that we're going to target four lens galaxies from about rich of one to rich of four, and uh, observe the ever-loving bejesus out of them because the overheads are so high that you can basically do anything for free if you just salute a telescope to look at it. Um, and so what we're essentially going to get is, is panchromatic imaging through all of the near cam and the mirror filters, um, and also IFU observations of H-alpha, hash-alpha, and the 3.3 micron pop feature. Um, and the idea here is that we will basically have access to every single tracer of star formation that anybody has ever proposed. Um, in, in all of these galaxies from Richard 1 to 4. And so we can sort of see like how well did they agree, how well did they disagree. If you only have one of them, what one should it be? Uh, and questions like this. So as, as much as it's possible to pick a, a wide ranging sample out of four objects, I think we've tried to do that. So we have galaxies that are relatively low mass, a few times 10 to the 9 in stellar mass, um, and also galaxies that are much more massive, uh, you know, several 10 to the 10. Uh, same thing in star formation rates, so we, we range from star formation rate of like, you know, 10 up to 1300. So we're really trying to span a lot with four galaxies. Um, and so the cool thing about this, like I say, is that we will have uh, these really deep H-alpha and passion alpha maps, um, and that basically will trace the warm ionized phase of the outflow for us uh, at match spatial resolution as we are getting the molecular wind. Um, so just for reference, here's what, what we can do right now at risk 2. Uh, this is with VLT plus AO, uh, and uh, essentially track uh, this very broad, high-velocity H-alpha emission. It spatially resolves, so it's not an AGN, um, and you get a map that looks like this. Well, we're, we're going to be able to reproduce maps like this at risk of 5, uh, and also have the molecular component of these winds at the same time. So I think this is going to be a really unique and powerful uh, method to, to look at feedback at the very high regimen. Okay, so I'm just about out of time, so just to sort of include uh, the, the things that I you know, hope to have convinced you of, quiescent galaxies are even more gas poor than you might have thought. Uh, they're certainly more gas poor than I would have thought. Uh, maybe I should have thought better, uh, but all indications were that uh, they should have been more gas rich than they were. Uh, this probably happens really early on and really quickly in the question process we know that these galaxies transition to quiescence very short, on very short timescales. Um, we also know that molecular winds are, are 
ubiquitous and high rates of starburst, and we can resolve their structure. And finally, uh, uh, future facilities like TLUC, especially, will be able to detect full multi phase structure of winds in, in even normal star forming galaxies, uh, which I think is going to be a whole lot of fun. So, thanks. Well, so they're these really small dust grains, right? Yeah. So it, uh, it's mostly coming from the obscure star formation, but you know, people have, have looked at this and found that the, that feature in particular correlates really well with the global star formation. A lot of that energy comes up from those volunteers. Yeah. And I was going to actually ask you the lower range ones, why aren't you looking at the longer wavelength? features, or just a lack of color uh, I think they didn't wind up in the same channel, and so we, we were going to do it. Okay. Is that right? Yeah, because they look at the pure through the longer way, like going to the aging and brighter, and then more, yeah. then they seem to take the correlated with. Yeah. I would have to double check to make sure that we're not doing that, but I'm pretty sure we're not doing that. I think we were just trying to get like a uniform set of observations for everything that we could, and since we couldn't do the longer uh, features for the higher edge sources, we didn't do it for the right one side. Yeah. So, you put that picture up. There's a very nice picture of where the different gas phases are. Mm -hmm. And we've just been told that, you know, they have a, some, for whatever reason, it's 100% absorption in cold molecular outflows. So yeah. that's, that's the red part of this diagram? Well, so in M82, that's, that's stuff that's like living right down here close. But M82 sure, is, is right. a little... Yeah, because right. that's where the... M82 has a nuclear starburst. Right. Um, and so that's it's kind of where the question is, you know, how good is M82 a proxy for, for the higher edges? It's supposed to be a picture of a cartoon picture of M82 specifically. Yeah, this one is okay. for M82. For M82. But what about the Euler? I mean, what I really want to know is, like, does this picture kind of fit them with the covering fraction and the yeah. factor of the one through C? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they do actually. So that that was kind of the reason for targeting the OH, because people saw outflows in them a lot. Yeah. Um, and so something like seventy-five percent of local Eulerics have winds in them, okay. um, and they see the same sort of like absorption depths and, and, and everything. So all indications are that the outflows that we've seen in region four and five are very typical of, of local Eulerics too. And you might be getting covering fractions of like fifty percent or so. Yeah. Although uh, you know we haven't super well resolved things yet. So it's possible that those covering fractions from the lens modeling will go down as we get higher resolution data. So it's a little bit more complicated yeah, because of lens modeling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it would be complicated without lens. Sure, you need the higher resolution. Here we can address it at least. So the higher resolution will help address the filling factor versus right. covering yeah. fraction. And the clumpiness. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's really nice. But here then, I mean, are we led to believe then that I mean, it depends a little bit on geometry, depending on what you would see. The, the yeah. molecular outflows and velocities versus the hot days outflows and velocities are the best way to change the weather. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep, so that would be true there. At least in the 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 hotter material is moving much faster, which uh, is also was, was seen here. So the stuff that's of low density is also at high temperatures, and that's the only stuff that's moving really, really quick um, from, from these simulations. Do you see similar to like 100 kilometers per second, second outflow yep. similar to Yep, 500,000 kilometers per second. Yep, easy. And so they, if you had to kind of plot that up, that would just change if you see the actual tilt. Uh, okay. right. If you have a higher density yeah. gas at higher velocities. Yeah, sure. Right. Well, you need to oh, right. it's here, it's up here. Yes, right. Uh, yeah, and so that's that's one of the, from what I understand from my, my theory friends, it's like this is like a huge problem for, for theorists, right? Is that it's really hard to get molecular material to move as fast as we observe it. So if you were to push on it with like supernova blast waves, you should basically shred it immediately and it will not be molecular anymore yeah. and you wouldn't see it. Same thing with winds, like radiation driven. So radiation driven winds, same same sort of story. Uh, that's a case where you might be able to salvage for ULERGs and, and the SMGs uh, just because they're so dusty that the dust can actually uh, touch them. Be a driving source. Yeah. The radiation pressure on the dust can actually be a driving source. Yeah. But we see molecular winds moving quickly in lower region galaxies, lower surface galaxies too. Okay. So cool. I don't know. Uh, theory seems hard. And 
computers hate me and I hate computers, so <laughs> I will let somebody else work with us. Did you insist on using DLA? Did that? Okay. Yes, <laughs> I understand that. Other questions? Just a dozen times scheduled, I think. Did you grab the last one? Yeah, we did. We moved it to two. Great. Yeah. All right, pay attention to that. There was some movement of that. Not that I, I didn't pay attention to it, so everyone else should pay attention to it. Otherwise, some of us are taking him to lunch. He's around, maybe go all through dinner. So yeah. seek him out, find time to ask him more questions. Thank you, Justin.